Welcome, Geert Palmers, to the Archive of Untold Stories. A part of that is the Extinction Survival Archive, this little collection of books I compiled a little over a year ago. So this is a rather naive way of thinking this would help out, and I realize it's totally inadequate, but I like to use these as a starting point. Because now I'm looking into gathering the information on how to survive a possible apocalypse. And in this case, from your point of view, being renewable energy. Let me maybe start with the fact that um, I think ap apocalyptic thinking is, is very common in times of uncertainty. And uh, if you combine the uncertainty we have now with COVID crisis globally, with economic crisis upcoming, uh, we don't know in what extent it will, will occur and have impact. The geopolitical tensions, which are giving a lot of uncertainty. So, your question then returns to how robust is our system that, in worst case, we can still have that comfort for human beings, for citizens, to enjoy heat, cold, our iPhone, our transport, mm -hmm. our mobility, and so on. To answer that question, we need to clearly understand how our system is composed and how vulnerable these components are. And let's go back, and I think it's very nice to do this story in the city of Brussels, because Brussels is uh, without any doubt a pioneer in the steps in energy history. In um, 1813, the first uh, time it was done to extract gas from coal and to use that gas to light buildings inside, outside. Mm -hmm. So that's early 19th century. So it was the first time that we had public lighting in Belgium, in Brussels. Now, interesting enough is that these companies who were exploiting these gas factories um, were also the ones who managed the transport at that time. And at that time, so 19th century, the transport for, uh, in the city center of Brussels were horses. Mm -hmm. So you had taxi drivers, alike with horses. Second phase of the 19th century, who so had tramways yeah. pulled by horses. The problem of that system was that you needed typically 10 horses for one tram because horses got okay. sick, exhausted, uh, they could only do 30 kilometers a day, so it was not a, a big thing. Uh, a second problem which was completely underestimated when that transport system became very popular, you had a lot of manure. And there was a scientific conference of urban planners in the end 19th century trying to solve that problem, but they stopped the conference halfway because there was no solution. Because the only solution to get that high volume of manure out of the streets was to use horses who were producing manure as well. So it was a vicious circle. <laughs> so it, they didn't have a prob uh, solution. But now come back to energy. The interesting thing is that these gas companies were controlling the transport companies with the horses, the same companies. Mm -hmm. And in 1880, if I'm not mistaken, Edison, the big inventor of uh, the electric bulb, he asked the concession uh, in Brussels to produce electricity, mm -hmm. which was extremely innovative. And that was, um, you probably know, the Museum of Contemporary Art of the city of Brussels, mm -hmm. uh, Place Saint-Catherine, Nelson Street. Yeah. That building was the site where I think 10 years after the concession asked by Edison, the first electricity was produced in Belgium and in Brussels on that spot. What's happening is that this electricity was much more efficient to light with the bulb of Edison that the gas companies got extremely nervous. They felt competition and as it is happening now in politics, these gas companies signed long-term contracts with all municipalities in Brussels that they mm -hmm. had to take off gas for decades. So Edison was blocked. It was a legal fight during many years and as is happening now, what happened? The gas companies bought the electricity companies and it became integrated companies uh, with gas supply, transport and uh, electricity. Now what happened in the next step is that these integrated companies uh, started to electrify the tramways. 
so the horse stock reduced. You had steam engines with coal for the outside, the suburbs and other cities, and inside the city with electrified tramways. So in 100 years you came from different inventions to a very heavily electrified system. And then the, the, the history continues, so in the 20th centuries you see uh, centralization of power station because the local power stations cannot cope with the growing demand. Everybody wants to light houses, streets and so on with electric power. The transport gets electrified, so we need big power stations. And the uh, heritage of that you can see uh, the power station in Vilvoorde, Drogenbos, Nederover uh, Heembeek, who's incinerating our wastes and producing of the waste heat electricity. So you see major industrial sites producing electricity for distribution beyond their borders. Yeah. That's a new thing in the 20th century. Now, a next phase in that is nuclear power in the 50s, starting 60s, 70s, 80s, and the international grid connection. So we are uh, getting strongly connected to France, Netherlands, UK through the uh, canal uh -huh. to Germany. And lately, uh, that's a very positive thing, is that the connection with offshore wind farms is, is, is getting uh, serious. That being said, coming back to Brussels, we started with decentralized energy. We got to centralized energy because of the growing demand. We got to a much more electrified system, but a very interconnected system. Mm -hmm. uh, so what our robustness should not be measured to the production locally but to the linkage and the redundancy of linkage in the system even beyond Belgium. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely strongly developed. Now, a, a final uh, chapter in my historical overview is what's happening lately. In the 90s, um, scientists discovered the uh, climate change uh, occurrence. Mm -hmm. That did rethink the energy system because it's uh, evident that as soon as possible we need to get rid of fossil fuels. So to do that we need renewable energy sources. I mentioned offshore winds, uh, onshore winds, but for a city the only compatible technology on large scale is solar. The very unique thing of that technology is that it um, has no moving parts. Mm which is very strange for an energy producing technology, so there is no maintenance needed. It has a very long lifetime. Mm -hmm. Because of no moving parts, there is no degradation of the parts. Secondly, it makes no noise. Everything what happens is silent. And it gives no exhaust, no pollution. Mm -hmm. There's no technology in history which produces energy from light, which is silent, no moving parts, no noise. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing. So for me, that's pure poetry in the energy business. That's why I started in, in that sector and I'm still in that sector. We got through this, this gas to electricity, electricity for lighting, electricity for transport, the uh, centralization of big power plants. Then in the 90s of last centuries, climate change. So we had to get rid of uh, fossil fuel in the next decade. So you get renewable energy, wind, mostly wind and, and solar, offshore, onshore wind, solar, which is compatible with the urban context. But now we see that the level of penetration of solar in the Brussels region is something like 100 megawatts. So it's a small conventional power station. Mm -hmm. So we need demand side management, shifting of demand in time without losing comfort and storage. Yeah. So the next two decades, I expect that you will have revolutions in storage just as we had the last decade in, in solar. Now to conclude, this evolution is something which happened over 200 years. But for me the conclusion is we have very strong electrification, which is a very elegant carrier mm -hmm. delivering our comfort. It's very um, interconnected which means robustness. If you cut one wire, even a big one, there are 50 others mm -hmm. connecting all of us electri electric wise. And thanks to, or as a consequence of the challenge of climate change, we're decentralizing again with renewable energy. 
So yeah. both the production as the distribution is very decentralized, very robust. So my honest opinion, we should focus our uh, fear on robustness of our system and ecopolyps, uh, thinking to other sectors than energy. There's two things uh, uh, about the two developments I've seen. I don't know if, uh, if it's uh, already in your scheme. One of them is a solar panel who actually produces hydrogen, which can later be used back in uh, the system again as a, as a source of power. But is uh, hydrogen safe enough to be used in a city environment? If you look to it in a rational way, hydrogen is only useful in industrial applications, aviation, maybe heavy trucks and boats. Heating of houses with hydrogen is bullshit and is, is completely ridiculous. And if you look to the application I mentioned, that's typically an industrial environment where safety uh, is something which is very well managed. In aviation, uh, if you work with kerosene, it's very critical as well. Yeah. If you work in the chemical industry in Antwerp, it's very well managed, all these things, the procedures, processes. So in these applications where it's useful, it can be managed safely. Mm -hmm. So I don't see a problem with safety linked to hydrogen. But let's not dream that hydrogen will solve uh, the energy supply of a city. Hydrogen nice. shall, shall function at the same level as crude oil did during yes. the... Yes, for specific oh, yeah. applications. Okay. We did some research with uh, meteorological institutes uh, in the Netherlands and uh, von Karman Institute in Brussels on that type of analysis. And um, for the next two, three decades, this will not be dramatic. But uh, it's certainly so that in the current investment of wind power, that investors already ask us to do simulations on the changing mm -hmm. wind climate on that side. But I don't think for the next, let's say, 50 years, that will be a big challenge or a blocking factor because um, the wind turbines now, the biggest one which is being uh, delivered very soon is 15 megawatt. It's uh, seven times as big as the first one which was installed in the North Sea, seven times bigger. <laughs> seven times bigger. So the technology behind is more advanced than the technology of the wings mm -hmm. of an Airbus or a Boeing. So you now see an outflow of the aviation industry to the wind, to industry, the wind industry because it's more challenging. That being said, the robustness of this technology is extremely high and yeah. the predictability is getting extremely high. So I don't see a blocking factor in the 50 years to come that we cannot rely on uh, offshore wind so you, on a large scale. Actually, you're saying, what you're saying is there's no possible way that the energy system will collapse. There will always be energy. Well, what has to be the worst case scenario for your uh, prediction to fail? If you look to other sectors like the virus crisis we mm -hmm. live now or the potential data attacks we're undergoing at this this moment, mm -hmm. I think that's more critical because the sector behind is not prepared enough. The whole machinery behind is not prepared enough. In the energy sector, I'm confident that we will not have a complete breakdown for a long period. What can happen and what will happen is sometimes a few hours. So I would spend my time on data security and uh, and viruses. And I don't know anything about that, so... Uh... <laughs> so actually the premises is wrong. They will have electricity. I'm, I, I can firmly say that I don't think we can go to a... we will go to a collapse in our energy system. The only worry I still have is that um, the contribution of the energy sector to climate change is, is important. Mm. We have the technology to solve that. But the uptake of the technology in society is going extremely slow. So even if you have a great technology which is competitive and which is as poetic as I said, no noise, no moving and mm -hmm. so on, it takes two, three decades before you get in the energy balance of the world to make the difference. Mm. 
So for me, the speed of implementation and the legislation to allow that is the most critical factor to limit the climate change uh, impact of the energy sector. But that's something different than your question. I don't yeah. think we go to, uh, we don't go to uh, a drowning energy sector and an interruption of our comfort. So no Mad Max scenarios? No. It's good that you mentioned that point because uh, as I said, the, the last decades we have been fighting as a sector to get profitable without subsidies. But now the, we have to be realistic and I think there are two, two chapters which should be on our table as energy entrepreneurs. It's the end of lifetime uh -huh. of the systems and it's the raw material. And I'm very happy to see that you see both on research level as on industrial side very serious initiatives. Let's start with the uh, raw materials because that's mm -hmm. in the beginning of the process. Yeah. Raw materials is, uh, I think you're right, um, the top 10 of the producers of solar cells are all Chinese. There is one which is called Canadian Solar. I thought it was Canadian, but it's owned by Chinese. So the top 10 is Chinese. They're very aggressive to get ownership over the mining of of rare materials being used. So both in wind and solar, which are assumed to deliver 80% of our system, energy system in 2050, all these raw materials Chinese are getting their hands on. If you look to research at the moment on uh, the basic technologies composing that future energy system, a lot of that effort is being done on being independent of these rare materials. So to find alternatives, both in batteries as in the permanent magnets in the wind turbines and so on. So I'm quite confident that that pressure will be released to a certain extent. But again, it's not clear what timing will be attached to that. And, and so the geopolitical tension which we had in the 70s with the oil crisis and uh, appearing from time to time with the Middle East and some oil producing companies. And also that tension was reflected in the UNFCC, so the United Nations Conference of Parties on Climate Change, with blocks, producers of fossil fuel mm -hmm. and the other ones. That geopolitical tension will shift to a geopolitical tension on raw materials, which are essential to get to this. Yeah zero carbon system and that should be top priority one of Europe and US and other continents to release that tension through innovation and other solutions. I was telling that you have these 5000 modules, solar modules produced Fast and so installed somewhere somehow and the first calculations which were done by the European Commission shows that 10% of the electronic waste by 2040 will be related to solar energy, mm -hmm. which is huge. That volume has to go down and has to get to a circular, circular economy. So there's quite some research active to recycle solar modules to new modules. And I'm quite sure that the mindset is such that companies who will not comply to that in one decade from now, they will not exist anymore. Yeah. For the blades of wind turbines, that's a very good one because it's a difficult one. Uh, blades of wind turbines, you can compare it a bit with the technology of both technologies, the fibers, polyester mm -hmm. alike, uh, a bit more advanced because of the fatigue load uh, mm -hmm. question. But there um, we see that uh, the largest research institutes in Germany and Denmark have that as a top priority because the sector will not continue to grow if this is not solved. So I, I, I have to admit that this is uh, underestimated, but it's a sector which is at the start of a growth path and now it's taking serious in research and in industry. Um, but let's see the facts. I'm not saying that this will be solved, but I think the right initiatives are being taken and Europe is at the forefront of that. Research is accelerating drastically and if you look to the um, energy decisions Biden took, mm -hmm. the major thing is investing heavily in innovation, accelerating innovation to market. So that's a good example where in a few weeks time he has put a plan on the table which is drastically accelerating 
all routes mm -hmm. which can contribute to the mitigation of climate change. So that's happening. The Green Deal of, of European Commission, I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of that because of the same reason. Mm -hmm. It's acknowledging that there is a big problem and that as a, a continent we need to be at the forefront, uh, to be leading thought maker and technology development and the budgets have, have increased. Mm -hmm. So I think that's happening. My only fear, as I mentioned before, is that once you have a technology which is capable of doing the job, to get it implemented and have the whole value change, chain um, operational to that's deliver the effect you need, that's another story. It means adoption by society, it means regulatory framework. I'm optimistic on technology side and I'm pessimistic on the rate of implementation and delivering the effect you need to cope with climate change. Okay. And that is something I don't see in the minds, uh, not of citizens, not of politicians, to make mm -hmm. that uh, more effective, more the opposite. But that's an interesting thinking route because this offshore wind is centralized renewable power, solar is decentralized renewable power. You can have, you have already, combination of yeah, you need a combination to be robust and to be very resilient. Uh, but ownership wise, as you mentioned, um, there are very nice example where the whole solar fleet of a city is owned by the inhabitants. Yeah. So the return on investment comes to the people itself. There is support for it. They care about it. With wind power, it's the same thing. So the combination of, of local um, financial involvement uh, will also ease the, the right application, aesthetically integrated, mm -hmm. where the people like it, don't like it, uh, to take into account all the opinions, but to make it go fast and effective mm -hmm. and robust at the same time. And that robustness, I think that's, that's on a higher level. And in that sense, I'm a strong promoter of, of Europe. Uh, without Europe, we would have been in a very shitty situation energy-wise. We would mm. not be robust. There are many uh, streams of thinking in, in, in that respect, and one of them is frugal engineering. It was a, an engineer who made a career shift, and he was looking to statistics of uh, newborn children. And it seems that the lack of having access to couveuses, I don't know in English mm -hmm. the word, is a major factor which can bring really a leapfrog difference. Mm -hmm. So that engineer, frugal engineering, he was thinking, how can I make a couveuse with uh, elements which can be maintained by local population inherently? And he was very smart and he said, what technology does always work in my country and suddenly he got the right idea he said a Toyota pickup always works if your Toyota pickup breaks down on a crossroads there are five Africans coming to repair it locally and you can knows. within one hour you're driving again so he composed a couveuse based on components of a Toyota pickup so the lamp of a Toyota pickup he used to heat the couveuse and all other components were coming from a Toyota pickup. Oh. So that's a startup company, that's frugal engineering. So meaning that you only use components which can be served, supplied, resilient society yeah. from the local industrial community. So th that's a tendency and that, that's the tendency I support and I like. What I don't like and that has its roots in the 70s in the early ecological movement that's the idea that you're only resilient and sustainable if you're self-supporting on a very small scale uh, as i said our robustness and even sustainability from our current energy system comes from interlinkages connectivity on an international scale combination of decentralization centralization these um, isolated communities producing everything locally itself, I think it's less sustainable than this interconnected system. That's my personal opinion. And that's for me a wrong route. Uh, we should not tell people that's the right route. Okay. We're gonna go In nature, global. there are very few robust things which are not a combination of the best of all worlds. All things, uh, yeah. yeah.
And usually nature is right. Geert, thank you for this talk. Thank uh, you, Sam. So I, I, don't, I don't have to worry anymore. You have my phone number if everything collapses. <laughs> that's, that's good. I have a good insurance. <laughs> yeah. So you don't think we're gonna we d we're not gonna have to go into the energy debate if we want to start up uh, our our Brussels preppers movement. It's it's very interesting, and theater will will engage people. But let's make sure that you engage them for the right thing. And robustness yeah. of the system is is not a big challenge. No. Let's engage them to make the climate impact of our system under control. Under control. And yeah. that's urgent and that's important. Yeah. But the initial question of robustness, let's forget that for the next two dec decades. Okay. We're not going to have to repower that uh, station at St. Catherine in a, in, a, in a very short time. It's repowered with contemporary art. Let's. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Let's push that. Let's push that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam.